our trip to Ecuador that we took a few weeks ago. So I'm just going to give you guys a quick report, and then we're going to be praying for Ecuador after this. So um, as you guys just saw, we brought a team of nine people to Ecuador this year. So we had Dale, Jessica, and Haley Carmen. We had Candice and Bella, Andrew Crawford, Jake Beatty, Josh and Val Green, and myself. Um, and so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to explain what we did on this trip. Uh, if you've never uh, heard about our trip to Ecuador, I'll kind of explain what is involved with that. And then also just share how is God working uh, the week that we were there as well as just overall how is God working in Ecuador. Uh, so most of the time that we spent in Ecuador was at a camp called Camp Chicalco. Okay, so it's a Christian kids camp similar to what you would think of as crossings here that our kids uh, just got back from. So it's, it's a Christian camp led by Christians who are Ecuadorians. And so they're teaching kids about the gospel, about Jesus, about the Bible, uh, while also having a really good time, okay? And so, and if you guys were here for VBS, all the money that was raised went to this camp in Camp Chicago to fund it, to help it, uh, to continue on, okay? So, so we went to the camp, and the majority of our time was spent helping out the staff there. So the staff are all believers. They're strong Christians. They're really good leaders. The camp is really well run. And so most of what we did there was basically helping support them in whatever they needed. So a lot of that was things like cleaning dishes, uh, serving food, sweeping, cleaning, really whatever was needed. Uh, we did some acting and some skits, dressed up and everything like that. And then also just spending time with the kids. So throughout the week, they had all different types of activities. And so we were just helping out uh, whatever was needed. And then also just being with the kids, spending time with them, encouraging them, and just trying to be a good friend to them. Okay, so that was the majority of the time that we spent in Ecuador was at this camp, and it was really good. Okay, so then alongside of that, when we weren't in the camp, we were also visiting some churches. So we actually got to visit with three different churches down in Ecuador, which is really encouraging. And I'll speak on that here in a moment. But so we met up with First Baptist Church Pelileo. We met up with Condoraqua Baptist Church, and then also uh, Curisisa Church in Apatung. Okay, so these are all three very different churches, very different culturally. Uh, they look a little bit different than us and how they do their services. Uh, but we got to spend time with them. Uh, we had some people have opportunities to preach. We had some opportunities to worship together and then just to pray together, which is really encouraging for all of us. And actually, that initially was not the plan for our trip. We were supposed to go to a different kids camp that was in the Amazon jungle, but there was some kind of landslide that uh, prevented us from getting there. So even though we didn't have our plans that we were set out for, it was really encouraging to still have this time to spend with these churches that we wouldn't otherwise been able to do. Okay, and then one other thing that was really unique, you guys probably saw it in the video that Jake put together, uh, we also got to give out Operation Christmas Child boxes. So if you guys don't know what those are, each Christmas, around Christmas season, we get some boxes, put some toiletries, put some toys, clothes, things like that in a box, and they get sent around the world to kids all over the world. And so we actually had the opportunity at the very end of camp with all the kids there to be able to hand out all of these boxes. And what was really neat was before they handed out any of the boxes, they sat all the kids down and they had a gospel presentation where they started all the way from Genesis and went through the story of the Bible and shared with them who Jesus is and what it means to be saved by God. And that was so neat because here we only get to see the first part of it, just putting the boxes together and shipping it off and not really, I mean, we see the videos, kind of see what it looks like, but it was really neat to be able to be on the other side of it, to hand out the boxes and to see how much they enjoyed it, how excited they were, but also even more important than that, to get to see that these kids are hearing the gospel every time these shoe boxes are handed out. And so that was really neat and also really neat to know that all of you in this room, even if you haven't been to Ecuador, in some ways you're playing a part in this and that you're sending these boxes overseas and these kids are going to be hearing the gospel through that means, which is really neat. So that was another thing that we did on the trip. Uh, we also did some sightseeing things and some other things, but those are really the three big, the major things that we did while we were there. So now I'm going to share very briefly, how is God working in Ecuador and how was God working the week that we were there? I think for all of us on the trip, one of the most encouraging things, which I've already mentioned, was just being able to visit with these other churches. It was so neat for us to visit churches who have a completely different language. 
Some, most of them were in Spanish, but also one of the churches, their primary language was Quechua, which is an, a language native to uh, Ecuador and other South American countries. So they have a completely different language. They have a very different culture. They have a different way of doing their worship services. Some were similar to ours and they had some of the similar songs, but a different language. But some of them had very different worship styles than us. And so we had all of these differences, but at the same time, all of us worship the same God, that they know the same God that we know. And the songs that we're singing of praise to God this morning are the same types of songs that they are praising and worshiping God in Ecuador. And so it's so neat for us in every church we went to, either us or that church mentioned that they were so encouraged that we had all of these differences, but yet we are united in Christ. That even though we share a completely different culture, different language, that we have more in common with them because they're our brothers and sisters than we do with someone who's not a believer who maybe is from America. And so it was really encouraging and very neat for us to see these other churches who are worshiping God um, in similar ways that we might. So that was really encouraging. And it was also neat to see that the gospel is spreading in Ecuador. So at the camp, they're sharing the gospel. They were teaching Bible stories. Kids were memorizing verses. And at the very end, there was a gospel presentation that was given. And so there were kids who believed from that gospel presentation, which is really encouraging. But as you guys know, the Christian walk is a race. It's a, it's a race of endurance. And so it's a lifelong thing. And so what was really encouraging is that there were people who were leading at the camp who were previously students at the camp 10, 15 years ago. And so that was really neat to see because it's not just these kids are hearing the gospel and then they're living their lives uh, however they want to. No, these kids, they're believing the gospel when they're young and the churches are discipling them and raising them up to know Jesus so that now when they're older, now they're serving the kids who are kids now and sharing the gospel with them. And so that was really encouraging for us to see. So we saw that. We also saw that there was a seminary right next to the camp, the kids' camp. And so this seminary is raising leaders who were the next generation of leaders in the Ecuadorian church. And that was really encouraging to see as well, that there's tangible evidence that the church is being faithful to share the gospel in Ecuador and that people are believing and responding to that. And that is so encouraging. That in the same way that we care about our community here in Fairdale, that they also care about their communities and are wanting to share the gospel in their communities. And in the same way that they want to know God more and know him deeper, we also want to know God in a deep way. And so it's so encouraging for us to hear that, you know, we get so bogged down in our own circumstance and how we can care for our community, but there's also churches all around the world who are also sharing the gospel and are being faithful to worship him. And so that was really neat for us to see. So, all that to say, it was a really encouraging trip. The team that went was really ready to serve. They had a really humble heart. And so, whenever we got there, we just hit the ground running and did whatever was needed. So, you guys should be encouraged that we're sending people who are willing to serve and wanting to, to love uh, the Ecuadorians. And so, that was really neat. So, if you guys haven't gone, I would really encourage you. We do this trip yearly, Lord willing. And so, next year, if we end up going, uh, by the grace of God, we should that you should consider going. I think it's encouraging for you if you're considering it, that if you go, you get to see God working around the world in ways that you can't just see here in Fairdale, that I'm giving you this report, but if you get to go next year or the year after, you get to see for your own eyes, how is God working all the way around the world? You also get a bigger view of God, just being able to be with believers from a different country to be in a different place and to see God working there, it just opens your eyes to see, man, God is so big that he created the whole world and that he is Lord of everyone, every culture and every people. And so that, that is encouraging. And then also it encourages us when you go for our team that went, when they come back, it encourages our whole church to be more missional minded. That encourages us that as you talk with people who went on the trip, you get to hear what God is doing around the world. And over time, as our church continues to make these trips, we get a vision of what God is doing around the world and his heart for the whole world. Okay, so I would encourage you guys, if you haven't considered going, I would encourage you to go. And if you're thinking about it, it is definitely well worth the time and the investment that you put into it. Okay, so if you guys saw in your uh, bulletins, you have this prayer card. 
So we put this together. So this right here is the view from the, the camp. There's a volcano right by the camp, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, but on the back, there's some information about Ecuador. So how many people are in Ecuador, um, the main religion in Ecuador, as well as how many of them, an estimate of how many believers there are in Ecuador. And there's also some ways to pray. So right now, um, we're going to pray through these, these three these three things, and I would encourage you guys over the next few months to pray for these specific requests, okay? So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity for our church to be a part of your work around the world. God, how humbling that is that this small church here in Fairdale, Kentucky can send a team to Ecuador, to a country thousands of miles away in a different continent, and that we could in some small way be an encouragement to the believers there to serve in whatever way was needed and to be a part of how your gospel is spreading to the ends of the earth. God, we know the great commission that you gave us was to make disciples in all nations, to baptize and to teach them to observe everything you've commanded us. And so God, we thank you that our church has a desire and a heart to obey your commission. That not only this trip, but God, we desire that your gospel get spread throughout the ends of the earth. And so God, we thank you and we praise you that the gospel has come to Ecuador, that there are believing churches there who believe the word and who are preaching faithfully, that people are coming to know you and growing in their love for you, and that even these kids at this kids camp at a very young age get to hear the gospel. God, that is so encouraging for us and refreshing for us because we realize the world is so big and it can seem daunting to think that the gospel needs to spread through the whole world. But God, we thank you that right now, even this morning, that there are churches gathered together in Ecuador who are praising and worshiping you, giving thanks to you, who are reading your word. And so God, we thank you so much for that. God, I wanna pray through these specific requests God, we pray for Kondorakwa Baptist Church, who currently is without a pastor. God, we know that that is challenging, that is difficult. And so, God, we pray for specifically Javier, who is a member of the church, who is discerning whether he should lead as a pastor of that church. God, we pray that you would give him wisdom and discernment. God, we pray that you would raise up leaders in this church who would faithfully shepherd it well. God, we pray for this church that they would be a gospel witness to their neighbors, to their family, to their friends, and that this church would be built up and grow as an influence for the gospel in their city. And God, we pray for First Baptist Church Pelileo. We pray especially for the new Christian families that have joined their church, that their church would disciple them well, that they would raise them up to know the Bible, that they would believe in you and they would read your word and they would spend time with you in prayer. So God, I pray that you would be with their leaders, that they would lead them well. And God, that you would be raising up a new generation of leaders in this church. God, finally, we pray for the kids at youth camp who heard the gospel. God, we thank you that there were some who believed. That is so refreshing for us and encouraging for us. And God, we know that a lot of those kids didn't have a church background. And so God, I pray for those who don't believe yet, that you would save them. That God, that they would remember what they were taught at camp and God that they would believe in you and that the church would have an influence on their life and pointing them to Jesus and so God thank you so much for allowing our church to go and to be a part of uh, this trip God thank you for allowing us to be a part of what you're doing in Ecuador and God we pray that Lord willing you would allow us to go next year that we could continue to be a part of what you're doing in, in Ecuador so God thank you so much we pray this morning that you keep us focused on you. God, that as we hear your word taught, that it would apply to our hearts and that your spirit would be working in us. So God, be with Josh as he preaches now. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that, Chris. What a good report. We've got good leaders here in our church, and we're thankful for them, Chris, and all the mission stuff and Garth with the student ministry and the baptisms this morning. Good job with that, Garth. I want to ask you now, if you would, turn to the Bible to John chapter 7. We're to the passage now about living water. Jesus declares that 
Uh, he gives living water that he uh, is able to satisfy and quench our thirst. And we've come to that passage, John chapter 7. Many mistakenly think that I am the living water is one of the seven I am statements. Uh, John has this big theme of the I am statements. And we've already been talking about them. We've encountered the, the first one already, which is from John chapter 6, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. These are massive, massive statements that you, you need to know. And over the course of our study, you're going to really cling to those. Jesus is declaring that he's God. And here's the way that he, as our Savior, relates to us. Like, I am the bread of life. So he is the food that we need need to sustain us and to to satisfy us and we've only encountered that one but a lot of people think that I am the living water uh, is another one but it's not this is not one of the I am statements so don't get confused or distracted by that today we have three verses John 7 37 38 and 39 Jesus is talking about the, the the change the power the working that he is going to do inside of people as he saves as he changes hearts as he uh, as people come to believe as people commit to follow him God will create a river of flowing living water inside of people now He's talking spiritually, all right? He's not talking about a real drink. We began this service with a case of Gatorades up here, and you probably know Gatorade's slogan. It's displayed right there on the front of that case. Gatorade says they are the thirst quencher. You've heard that before, right? And I think it's just a marketing thing. You drink Gatorade and you're still thirsty, I think that's part of the plan. You make a drink that makes people want to drink more so that you sell more. Jesus is talking spiritually. He's not talking physically. Uh, We drink a lot, and we know what it is to be thirsty, right? We eat a lot of salty foods, which make us thirsty, and so we end up drinking a lot. Have y'all thought about how much we drink? I was at a restaurant recently, and I was already finished with two glasses of sweet tea before they brought anything. Before they brought any food or anything, they set my drink down. I drank the whole thing. As soon as the server returned again, I said, hey, can I get a refill, please? And, 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 and I was drinking that down before anything had gone. We drink a lot. Nowadays, if you go over here to the gas station to get you a Polar Pop, the, the small is the 32-ounce. My kids are always like, why are you getting the small one? And it's like this huge drink. Why, why aren't you getting the big one? It, it, you can get the 64-ounce drink if you want one. And if you really want to upgrade, they got a five-gallon bucket over there with a cap and a straw in it if you want to get that. And I see people with those. Not only are they quenching their thirst but, or trying, but they're proving <laughs> it is not quenching their thirst. They have to drink nonstop all day long. And you know what? I hate to admit it, but sometimes people are filling that up with big red. Imagine. All that to say, we we know what it means to thirst and to drink and to try to quench. And those are all the things that Jesus talks about in our passage today, but he's not talking about drinks. He's talking about our soul. He's talking about who we are. And Jesus is the master teacher. He's the best teacher the world's ever known And so he's like that. He knows how to talk about something as as simple. Everybody in the room, no matter what you're into, whether you're a five-year-old kid or a 90-year-old adult or anywhere in between, whether you exercise a lot and are really into drinking water or whether you hate water and you drink your Diet Coke all day, every day, everybody in the room knows what it means to be thirsty and to need a drink. And the greatest teacher the world has ever known, the Lord Jesus Christ, uses that simple, beautiful, profound illustration to speak about what's going on inside of us. You and I are thirsty in life. We are. You and I want out of life what life is supposed to deliver. We may go back and forth on how thirsty we are, how longing we are, or how content we are. We We can debate that stuff all we want, but the truth is, you and I want out of life the things that life can deliver. And in our passage today, we have Jesus speaking to this. Read with me, if you will, from John 7, 37 to 39. 
On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Y'all, this is a very, very rich passage. One of the challenges that I'm dealing with working through all of this is how long is it going to take us to get through the Gospel of John? And, you know, this is already multiple sermons in chapter 7, and I'm, I'm trying to work through how many verses should we cover, how, many, how much. But, but today, these three verses are, are so important, they're so key that we've got to spend some time here. J.C. Ryle, commenting on these three verses, 7, 37, 38, 39, says this. It has been said that there are some passages of Scripture which deserve to be printed in letters of gold. Of such passages, the verses before us are one of those. This passage contains one of those wide, full, free invitations to mankind which make the gospel of Christ so eminently the good news of God. These verses are like that. They speak, they deliver, they point us to how good God is, how how true it is that God's loving, forgiving, accepting, welcoming message to all that would come to him, anybody that would come to him, is such good news. I want to give us five points this morning. And I know that with baptisms and an Ecuador report, we're already looking at time, but I'm going to get us through it, okay? Five points this morning. Number one is the word satisfies. For you kids that are using a listening page, that's our word, satisfies. Our passage today shows us that Jesus alone satisfies, that Christ is the and the only thirst quencher for life. You don't hear this phrase a lot, Jesus only satisfies or Jesus alone satisfies or Christ alone satisfies. We just don't use the word satisfaction that much. Um, and, and, and a lot of that is because we're, we're a little bit distorted on what satisfaction is. We think of a, of a thrill or a temporary thing that makes us happy as being what satisfies. That's really not ultimately what the word satisfies means. It's been distorted for us uh, in, in our day. Satisfies mean, uh, speaks actually more truly and accurately to being content. I'm enough. I'm, I'm full. It's all good. I don't need anything else. That's what the word really means. In this passage today, Jesus goes to a topic that's not new. He's not just bringing it up. This idea of Jesus being the living water, the one that satisfies, the one that quenches our longings in life, it's found throughout the the history of the world and throughout the word of God. It's throughout the Old Testament that God speaks of the saving work, the eternal life work, the, the going to heaven, the being in relationship with him. God speaks to that a lot in the terms of Water and refreshing and redemption and being alive and being healthy. These things that God is doing in the world and preparing for his kingdom in heaven, he talks about a lot. Here's just a few verses. Isaiah 12, 3, you will draw with joy, you will draw with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. He's talking about salvation, the need for forgiveness, the, the heart work that we need from God. But he says it as somebody who goes to a well and drops the bucket deep down, needing water, and brings it back up, and they get that. That's how God describes it. In Isaiah 49, he he makes that declaration speaking of salvation and eternal salvation in heaven. He says, they will never thirst again. You remember from Revelation 7, we have that being said again. Quoting Isaiah, they will never thirst again. They will never hunger again. They will be with me and I will be their God and they will be my people and they will be with me forever content. 
It's in Isaiah 49. It's again in Revelation 7. Already in the Gospel of John, when Jesus found himself at the well with a Samaritan woman, he brought this up to her. You remember that? He said, hey, he asked her for a drink, and, and she says, how are you asking me for a drink? And he says, you would have asked me for this, and I would have given you living water. He brought it up. It didn't go into as much detail as we have in our passage today, but it's still the same idea. Jesus is talking about salvation, and he uses it with water. Our, our uh, scripture reading that we read just a little bit ago that Jake read is from Isaiah 55. And that whole passage is about the saving work that God is doing in the world. God changes lives. And you know how that passage begins in Isaiah 55, 1? Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. God is describing what he does inside of people as being compared to you being so hot and thirsty and dehydrated and maybe sweaty and saying, I need something to drink. And you get that big glass of water. And what that does to you in a moment, in a temporary solution, is what Christ does. Our first word today is satisfies. If you look back here at John chapter 7, it tells us this, the last day of the feast. Remember this chapter began by telling us that it was the feast of booths. So there's some continuity there. We know what the feast is and what he's talking about. It says that Jesus stood up in verse 37 and he cried out. This is a declaration. This isn't a private conversation. This isn't him just trying to explain the ways of God to somebody that he's talking to. This is a standing up. This is a crying out. This is a proclaiming. If anybody thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Don't miss here that this is absolutely Jesus saying, claiming, I am the Savior of the world. This is exclusive. This is, he is the one. He is the one that satisfies. I don't know where life has you right now. I don't know if you're thinking, man, I just need some more money. I just need some more friends. I had somebody tell me yesterday, they need a friend. I'm talking about an adult, too. They don't really have a friend, and they need a friend. I had somebody tell me that yesterday. I don't know where you're at in life with all that sort of stuff. I don't know if you need a, you need a mate, you need somebody, you need a better job, you need better parents. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you need in life, but all of us find ourselves longing for life to deliver what it can, and we search, and we search, and we search. We try this and we try that. And I mean, I hope this will work. You know, I'm going to get me a gym membership and maybe meet some people there and start working out, try to do better. You know, maybe that will be the answer for my life. And I want you to hear today that there are all sorts of good decisions to make in life, things that are better for you, you know, things that will help you. There are. But the deep, deep thirst inside of you can only be satisfied. By what Jesus Christ does inside of us. That's what he's declaring here. That's what so many of us have come to know through the work that he's doing in us. It's what all true Christians know worldwide. Christ is the treasure. He's what quenches those longings. The peace with God. The joy now, I want to remind you, I said earlier that sometimes satisfied to us means like thrill, excitement, pleasure. That's not the realest, most accurate meaning of satisfying. The, the realest meaning of satisfying is contentment. I'm good. I don't need anything else. And so I really want to help you think through what it looks like to be a real Christian, to be a follower of Christ. Don't buy into the, 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 the world's message of bigger and better and louder and whoever's got the most energy, energy or the best vibes or the, you know, the cool, world, cool word now with the teenagers is the best aura. You know what I mean? Like That is not how we equate Christianity. It happens all the time. Churches fall into it. Ministries fall into it. And they think that that's how you show that you know God by being the best or the coolest or the prettiest or the acting like you're the most happy. That's not what satisfies means. If Jesus has quenched inside of you what you long for, you don't need anything else. There may be more energy going on over there with that new religion or that new fad. There may be more energy or excitement going on with this or that or bigger money or more success or louder or whatever. 
And the person that has Christ is not sucked into that. We're happy for people that do anything that makes them happy. Good for them. But the answer to the soul is Jesus Christ who knows us and loves us. Knows our failures, still loves us. Knows when we sin against him, doesn't run away from us. Sticks with us as the one who offered himself, gave himself to die on the cross for us. Not because we're so good, but honestly, because we're not so good. Because we're bad. Because of our failings. Because of our sins. And being loved by God satisfies the soul. And you come to be loved by God through the work that God did through his son on the cross. Through the death, burial, and resurrection. I don't want you to hear this morning that Jesus will make your life the biggest and best thing. Sometimes he does that with people and sometimes he doesn't. Christianity is filled with suffering. The way of Christ is often met with hardship and adversity and disappointment. But he's the answer and he's the satisfaction. Sometimes we deal with things and we're like, God, why? But God is to be our satisfaction through it. When Jesus declares here, if anybody's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He is totally saying that he is the savior of the world. And that he is the answer for what your soul longs for. Number one, Jesus satisfies. Ryle commenting on this says, the thirst before us in this passage is purely of a spiritual kind. It means anxiety of soul, conviction of sin, desire of pardon, longing after peace in your conscience. When a man or woman feels his sin, and wants forgiveness, and is deeply sensible of his soul's need, and earnestly desires help and relief, then his is that state of mind which our Lord had in view when he said, if anyone thirsts. This declaration from Christ is not just, hey, if you're looking for something better, come to me. It it certainly means that, but it's not as simple and shallow and basic as that. It's deep. All that is lacking in you, all that is empty or hurting or wrong or rebellious or offensive to God in you, he has come to satisfy. And on the cross, he took it, took our sin and took our shame. And when we trust in him, we are satisfied. While Jesus is certainly The life, we talk about him being the way, the truth, and the life. That was his declaration. While Jesus is certainly the life and the Savior, Jesus is also the way. And here in this statement, we see him being the way. And God's way is the best way. Number one is satisfies. Number two is the solution. Solution. Believing in him is the solution. And in in some ways this goes without saying, but he mentions it here, and so we got to stick with it. Look at verse 38 in our passage. Whoever believes in me, unless you or the woman at the well, remember how she thought, the woman at the well or you or anybody else thinks, okay, what do I need to do? I really like the way Garth said it when he was up there and kind of speaking to how these young ladies got to the point of getting baptized. They come and they've got questions, they want to talk or whatever. But the answer to how you get baptized is not doing something. He even said at one time, hey, what, what does it take, right? And the answer is to be trusting in Christ. When Jesus speaks of this grand analogy of drinking and never thirsting again, living water inside of you, he says here at the beginning of verse 38, whoever believes in me. Church, we cannot let momentum and we cannot let like uh, uh, um, uh, energy or we cannot let efforts and good works take over who we are and what we do and what we proclaim and what we teach and how we disciple and how we minister. It's very simple according to the truth of the word of God. We tell the truth of God, we tell the truth of God, we tell the truth of God, and God causes people to believe. And there is no other solution than faith in Christ. It's not faith and something else. It's not good parents. It's not good home. It's not good schools. It's not those things. Those make a better society, sure. 
But for you to be right with God and be satisfied in your soul, you must believe. And when I say believe, I don't say lip service. I don't say check a box. I don't say wear a T-shirt. I mean deep down inside of you when nobody's looking at midnight on a Friday night and you're sitting in bed thinking about every single thing in life. Your treasure, anchor, foundation to who you are is what Christ has done for you. That's what I mean. I don't mean there's a meeting on Wednesday night if you want to come here and go gather with those people. I don't mean you're looking for a group of teenagers that are not into bad things or, 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 or a group of teenagers that are trying to do some fun stuff and you're trying to connect with them. That's not it. It's right here, John 7, 38, where he says, whoever believes in me. The solution to getting that satisfaction is faith in Christ. It is not what you do for him It is what he has done for you in believing it. It is faith and faith alone. It is how your heart trusts in him. When Paul was writing his letter, when when Paul was writing his letter to the Ephesian church, you've heard these verses before, but along these lines, listen to how he says it here in Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. It is not a result of works so that no one may boast. You don't do it, works don't do it, boasting doesn't help, it is what Christ has done, it's the gift of God, and do you believe it, believe it, believe it, deep down in your core. Now, Just because you and I know lots of people that say they believe it and we're convinced they don't really believe it. Just because there's so many hypocrites in the world and so many nominal religious people in the world doesn't negate that it's not happening sometimes in some places by some people. Come on, that means you're looking for an excuse. If you want to discredit it like that, well, I know some people that say they believe and they're the most hellacious people I've ever met in my life. Okay, That doesn't mean the real child of God over here that's broken in their sins and on their face crying out for the blood of Christ to forgive them. It don't mean that they're a fake. A million fakes doesn't mean the real one's a fake. Come on, stop with the excuses. The solution to the world is the work of Christ. That God left heaven, came to earth, experienced all that this earth has, and then defeated it by his holy righteousness, complete obedience on the cross. And then God says, I did that for you. If you're thirsty, come and drink. Come and grab hold. Commit to it, believe it, surrender to it. Embrace him, the king of kings. That is the solution. When commentator says, there is no clearer proof of the fall of man and the utter corruption of human nature than the careless indifference of most people about their souls. No wonder the Bible calls the natural man blind, asleep, and dead, which the Bible does. When so few people can be found who are awake, alive, and athirst for salvation. The solution to wanting your thirst quenched, to being satisfied, is to believe in Christ. Verse 38 says, whoever believes in me. While Jesus certainly is the way, and God's way is the best way, he is also the life. He is the Savior, the solution. Number one, satisfies. Number two, solution. Number three, scriptures. Look what he says next here in verse 38. you got to catch this. Verse 38, whoever believes in me as the scripture has said. Does everybody see that? People that like to go against the Bible or don't believe the Bible or discredit the Bible hate when this happens. They absolutely hate it when this happens. Jesus here is not declaring my words, the final word, you know, do what I say. Jesus here is saying, here's what the truth is because my father said it a long time ago. 
Jesus is the word in the flesh. He never, ever contradicts anything that the whole Bible says. And people try to do that, too. They want to pit Jesus against the Bible. It's so futile to do that. It won't get you anywhere. But notice here that Jesus is perfectly fine to say, hey, Last day of the feast. Everybody listen here. He stood up. He cried out. If anybody here is thirsty, come to me and drink. And they've been hearing their whole lives for generations that God has a salvation. And it's likened to water. It's likened to a well. It's likened to something happening inside of you. And Jesus speaks up on the great day, the last day, and says, if anybody's thirsty, come to me and drink. How? Believe in me. Why? The Bible says that. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, is affirming the word of God, pointing us to the word of God. He is the truth. He's living out the truth. He's pointing people to the truth. There is such a continuity and and the same message coming out of the in the flesh Jesus Christ, God, man, and the living word of God, which is in a book. Notice that he says here, believe in me. As the scriptures have said. And then he starts talking about what the scriptures have said here. He says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, we got to be honest about our hearts. Man, our hearts hurt, don't they? Man, we struggle. I do. You do. Our hearts hurt. They feel empty at times. They feel hurt. They feel crushed. And Jesus is here speaking about what, God, what only God can do. Remember, he's the only one that satisfies God can make your heart have a living river, a fountain in it. That's what he does. And it's the scriptures that reveal this, teach us this, affirm this, clarify this, bring light to this. We are people who are growing in our knowledge of God as God has revealed himself to us through the word. Now, we get to come at it from two different angles. We get to read about what God has been doing throughout the history of the world for a long time. We've got stories from a long time ago. But we also get to come at it as a study. You can use this book or or other extra sources about the life of Christ, who was a real person that lived on earth. But The scriptures are teaching us what we need to know. The scriptures are teaching us that our heart needs to be forgiven of its sins. The scriptures are teaching us that our heart longs. You ever, you ever, you ever heard like I, I just I felt that with all my heart. I desired that with everything in me. My deepest desire. I want that with all my heart. And the scriptures are teaching us here that God will do a work in your heart that's like flowing water, a living source of being quenched, a living source of being satisfied. Now, on my first point of satisfied, I I, I mentioned to you many, many passages that speak of God's salvation being like water. Lots of references in Isaiah, references in Ezekiel, references in Revelation, multiple mentions here in the Gospels. It's the scriptures that have taught us that analogy And it is the work of Christ now living that out. You and I will go no farther in our religion, our spirituality, our faith, than we will go with the truth of the word of God. May I warn you today to not try to push on without it. May you not try to keep doing this thing for God and holding on to him without the truth. May you be strengthened in your faith today by the very words of verse 38 where he says, Whoever believes in me as the scripture has said, even the Lord Jesus Christ who knows all things and has all authority stands upon the truth of the word of God. And we will too. Number one, satisfies. Number two, uh, solution. Number three, the scriptures. Number four, the spirit. This is where this passage gets really good on teaching us. Notice in verse 39, it says, Now this he said about the spirit. The Holy Spirit coming into our lives is like the water flowing out of our hearts. This is what he's teaching. Notice that it says there in verse 39, Whom those who believed in him were 
to receive. Now that means it's going to happen, so I'll talk about that in my fifth and final point. But for now, we're talking about the Spirit. The teaching of the Bible is upon believing in Him, the Holy Spirit creates life inside the believer. It is the supernatural work of God, the Father in heaven, of how he is creating people to be his children. We read back in John chapter 1 where where the gospel tells us that you have to become a child of God. You're not a child of God naturally. If you never become a child of God, then here today, you're not a child of God. You don't become a child of God through baptism. Remember, he hasn't mentioned baptism. You become a child of God when you truly believe. And I can't tell when you truly believe. We can't tell when you truly believe. But when your heart truly, truly says nothing else but what Christ has done for me. When you get to that position, God is making you his child. His Holy Spirit is going to work inside of you. That's what he's talking about here in these verses. The Holy Spirit creates that life inside the believer. It's the supernatural work. It's the new birth. It's the new creation. It's the born again. You've heard that before. You've heard a lot of this talk before, right? You've heard the Bible say that that your body is a temple that the Holy Spirit lives in. The Bible teaches us that. Jesus teaches that the Father will send the Spirit. We've got all of this good stuff coming out of the Gospels of Jesus' teaching. R.C. Sproul writes that this is the Messiah, the Savior's gift to his people. He gives. He baptizes. He fills people with his Holy Spirit. But this blessing in its full measure and glory must await for the ascension of Christ who will pour out the Spirit from heaven upon his people. In other words, at the time where Jesus is saying this, according to verse 39, it hasn't happened yet. The Spirit is absolutely a huge part of Christianity and the advancement of Christianity and the lives changed in the world. But at the moment where Christ is speaking here, it hasn't. So he says it's, it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit is what is on earth working because Christ is no longer here. You need to be reminded today that Christ came and he left. Jesus is not here on earth. And any time we say, like, Christ is here, or Christ, is, you know, Christ is with us or whatever, we mean the spirit of Christ, not, not Christ. Jesus Christ is a human being, and he is no longer here on earth. He's in heaven, seated at the right hand of God until he will return. And so, under the plan of God and the goodness of God, he left as a gift the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in the world working and when God, when God saves somebody, the Holy Spirit comes to be inside of them. This, look at verse 39. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given. The Holy Spirit is the power working in you and in the world. If somebody is not a Christian, they don't have the strength and the power to turn away from their sins. They don't have the strength and the power to try to walk in obedience. The Holy Spirit is the one that does that. Number one, satisfies. Number two, solution. Number three, scriptures. Number four, spirit. And lastly, number five is the word send. This is important. At the end of verse 39, we have, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. This tells us there's a timeline. We've been talking the last several weeks, earlier in John chapter 7, we've been talking the last several weeks about Jesus on a mission. Jesus Jesus has a plan. He came. He's got to complete it. There's lots of times where he says, it's not time yet. It's not time yet. It's not my time yet. And so we see he's on a timeline. Well, this here absolutely speaks to a timeline. The Spirit's coming. Y'all are going to receive him, but he's not been given yet. And then it tells us why. Because Jesus was not yet glorified. And the glorification of Jesus is the death, burial, and resurrection. The fact that they could with all evil come against him, lie against him, spit in his face, slap his back the most times that they're allowed to do. And they did it five times. 
tear him to pieces, shred him up, pluck out his beard, mock him, put fake robe and crown on him and mock him, and then nail him to a cross and humiliate him in front of all the people to see, hanging on a cross to die and say, we're getting rid of you, you fake, you imposter, you joke of a person that claims to know God. Get out of here, we're done with you. And then three days later, he's back. He overcame them, he overcame their evil, he overcame the wickedness of the world, he overcame their, 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 their wrongful judgment against him, he overcame sin, and he overcame death, and he lives, and he is undefeated, and he is unstoppable, and he lives now. He's not afraid of anything, he reigns on high in all power and authority, Christ does. He is that living God that king and savior of the world. And after he did all that, in all of his power, he left. And in a very real way, this all happens and unfolds for us in Acts chapter 1. When Christ left, he said, now the spirit will come. And since Christ is no longer here, God sent the spirit. And the spirit is working. We just heard Chris Herod tell us there are churches growing and people coming to faith in Ecuador. We've had people in our church very recently go to the even further parts of the world and they say, hey, there are churches growing and people coming to faith in Christ. God is working by way of the Holy Spirit which Jesus sent when he left. Church, we need to understand that in these three verses, 37, 38, and 39 of John 7, we see what God is doing in the world. Christ finished his part. Christ finished his task on earth, and he left, and he sent the Spirit. And what you and I are experiencing, and there's absolutely no denying it. That's the power of personal testimony. What you and I are experiencing is this declaration right here is what God's doing inside of me. And I don't even have to ask you. I know. We're your pastors. We know. We spend time with you all. We're church family. This is what so many of you all are experiencing right now. Those verses are what's happening in my life. I remember clear as day, and there's no turning back, that I was a teenager hearing sermons, Lost as can be, so wrapped up in sports and that identity. And the word of God just took hold in my heart. And the river started flowing. And I got to college. I was 18, 19 years old. And the river started flowing like it's never flown before in me. The living water. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm resolved. I'm going to live for God. And I don't care if anybody else does. But in that attitude, guess what I found out? There's a whole lot of other people living for God. And guess what's happening in Fairdale right now? A whole lot of other people living for God. And everywhere we turn, we're seeing more and more people. There are people here today. It's the first time they've ever been to this church. And they're, seeing, they're sensing that the living water is working in a lot of people. There's teenage girls right there who are saying, the living water is going to work inside of me. I don't know a lot. Don't know who I am fully. Still trying to figure out this life. But the living water is going to work inside of me. Because Christ did the work. He gave his life for us. And he sent the spirit to keep it going. And that's what we're seeing. When Christ is glorified, the cross is held up. The death for our sins is held up. The resurrection that he's alive is held up. That he did that for us. And if you'll come to him, he'll satisfy your heart. When that is preached and taught and disciples are made under that, That spirit goes to work, and that's what we're seeing. God is working. If you want your soul to be satisfied, trust in Christ. That's the solution to our sin problem. The scriptures point us to it. The spirit is working in it, and he sent that spirit for us. May we find our strength together, united as a people, that Jesus is the answer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this good Sunday morning, for Ecuador reports and baptisms and the living word that tells us about the living water. 
God, we know what it is to have our thirst quenched or to try to quench it. But Father, we also know that we really need it. And so we thank you here today that we are hearing that Jesus Christ declares himself that he is that. Father, may we no longer look for satisfaction in other things. May we turn from that. May we repent of that. Oh, Father, help us to trust fully and rest in what Christ has done for us. May we say that we believe. Father, work in our hearts, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing one final song.